it's important to know your Bible. Because no matter what you're dealing with, no matter what you're struggling with, no matter where your questions are, most likely the answer is here. This is the DNA of Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was Jesus. He came in flesh. The Word came in the flesh, it says in John chapter 1. We got to know what he's saying. We got to know what the truth is because we're sitting in a place where there is no truth. The truth is whatever anybody wants to make it up. But how do you lean on the truth when you're looking for answers? This is going to be kind of a different Bible study. But I want to start off with Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1. It says, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high and have becoming so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now, the, the writer of Hebrews here is using a whole bunch of, of, of words here. He's fairly wordy. It's possible it's Paul. But he's saying, in the past, God spoke to people through his prophets and through interesting situations. These days, he speaks through Jesus. And where do we find that? It's in the Bible. We can see where Jesus speaks to us, why the truths make sense. And so when you're dealing with something, you go into the Bible and find a place where it explains kind of what you're dealing with and then how to handle it. God is really good about that. But the question is, is now that the prophets are gone, does God talk to us? Does he bring us examples? Are there signs and wonders that says, hey, I'm trying to get your attention. Pay attention. I contend there is. This Bible study is concerning things that God does that gets our attention so we can get back into the word and look for what he's trying to say. Now, I want to tell you a couple of stories about myself. I want to show you a couple of stories here in the Bible. And I want to tell you why this all came about and how it all works. When I retired from police work, I was broken. My identity was taken away and I didn't know what I was going to do. Now, at that point, for the last six years of my career, I had been worshiping. I had been worshiping God and praising his name. I had been laying hands on and praying for people out on the street. I had been working with people that I see all the time in an effort to get them to turn their lives to Christ and be changed. It, is, it was happening. Things were awesome. I was the point of a spear in the midst of people who would never go into a church, never darken the doorway of a church. And he hurt me. I got hurt. God allowed it. it. Took me off the street. I had to medically retire. I didn't know what he was doing. But why? Why would you remove me from what I was doing. I was doing good work for you, Lord. Why? I was broken and I couldn't, in my heart, I couldn't be the same. I didn't have the same effectiveness. And now I'm looking, I'm wondering what my next job is and if I'm ever going to be able to do this again and how, what is God's plan? Oh man, I, let me tell you, I walked out one morning into my driveway and there were two doves. Now doves around here in Colorado fly around in pairs. There were two of them. It landed on my basketball goal, and they were sitting there when I saw them, just for me. One of them was beautiful. And if you've seen a, a dove, and these are, they're gray doves, but they have these beautiful fan-shaped tails. Doves, if you didn't know it, are the fastest to take flight, the quickest flying bird in nature. They're hard to catch because they can get airborne faster than any other bird. 
This is what this is because their feathers are so wide and they're so effective. The other bird didn't have a tail at all. There were no feathers there. They were sitting side by side. One had feathers and one did not. Now, I've always been under the impression you need tail feathers to fly. And so I'm looking at this interesting situation, one I've never seen before. Something that made me stop and look at it and, and think about it and meditate on it and wonder what on earth it might mean. Now, I have under, I've come to the understanding that God is really good at showing me something out of the ordinary and then, and then showing me the meaning afterwards. Whether I'm reading in the Bible or, or, or it's the situation itself that gets interpreted in the Bible. Either way, I'm sitting here wondering, God, what do you want me to know? Wouldn't you know it? Those birds flew at the same speed over across the street and over the house. That bird with no tail feathers flew like it had the biggest tail feathers on the planet. What am I supposed to say to that? It's a broken bird. The bird should be broken and he's not. He's effective. He's being a bird. And it took a second. But I felt the spirit lead in me that says, Matt, you're broken and you can't do what you want to do, but you're still effective. Be effective for me. I'm just going to change the venue. I'm going to change the situation. I'm going to make things happen around you in ways you've never imagined before. You're going to be in, you're, although you are broken and although you're going to suffer, you're going to be more effective and sitting here today, looking back the two years since that situation, I can tell you it's true. Therefore, the message was received. It was understood, brought to me by the Holy Spirit, and I understood it. It's a cool story. Another one, I was watching the Bible study concerning the falling away of the church, how society is starting to drag the church into its own, it's into its own sinful behaviors. The world is starting to envelop the church. The church needs to stand apart from it. But if you're paying attention, and we look at First and Second Timothy, both of them in chapter 4, you'll see documentation in there that says, look, in the last days, people are going to be drawn away by itching ears. They're going to be drawn away by doctrines of demons. They're not going to look for God's word anymore that's listed in this book. Instead, they're going to go after what they want to hear. And it's true, and we're watching it happen. But after that Bible study, I went outside to stand under the stars and pray. And up, up was the full moon. And there was a really thin layer of clouds that allowed the full moon to kind of shine on this shimmering thin layer so that I could see stuff. I could see stuff in the air. I could see the outline, even though it was dark, I could see the outline of airplanes and birds. And I see this small flock of birds, not very big, maybe 20, not much like these two F-16s right here. And I, and I pay attention, and they're flying that way, really high up in the air. And I just watch this, this flock of birds, and I, and, I, and I look at it for a minute, and I'm like, okay. That's interesting. They're flying at night, flying in the dark. It's cold out here. But I can see them. God put them exactly where I could see them. In a giant sky in the dark. Well, I look up again a few moments later, and there's another flock of birds. You can tell they're the same birds by the way that they 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 kind of flock together and the way that their, their wings are flapping, the size, general, all that information. I can tell that. This one was bigger. This one probably had a hundred, maybe a hundred birds in it. And the birds flying the exactly the opposite direction. Now, wait a minute. I was led to believe that birds always fly in the same direction. 
If, if they're going to go, geese go the same direction. Then geese come back the same direction. Why is it that a small group at high altitude is flying one direction, another group in a lower altitude is flying in the opposite direction? And I thought, that's interesting. I kept praying. It wasn't long until I noticed that little group of birds flying the other way. They changed direction to follow the bigger flock of birds. Why were they flying that direction in the first place? And why on earth were they drawn back if they had a reason for Why were they drawn back into the bigger flock? Well, it shouldn't be hard to see the interpretation. A small group, that is the church, flying at a higher altitude, a higher level, a higher moral level, flying one direction was sucked in by the world. The world system coming the other direction, directly opposite direction, and it was bigger, and it was at a lower altitude, a lower moral standing, and it drew that other flock of birds away. Perfectly fit with what I just heard on TV when I was in a... Bible study. See, the Bible tells us when, when we see things that are out of the ordinary, we need to take notice. Now, no doubt they've happened in your life, and maybe you said, well, that's just coincidence, or man, that's kind of weird. But when you start to see God in everything, and that God is sovereign and he can make anything happen they want, it's possible that something that would happen in your life would just kind of be coincidence. And, but maybe it's not. Maybe God is using it to get your attention. And we start to think and mull over what the Bible says and why it's important. The Bible illustrated the birds. The Bible illustrated the two birds because of my brokenness. And if you were thinking that this is just stuff that I'm making up, there are stories in the Bible that that very clearly God set something up that was out of the ordinary in an effort to get the person to see it and learn something from it. And I start in Exodus chapter 3. Moses has killed that Egyptian and he's run into the desert and for 40 years he's out there dealing with Jethro's flock. 40 years of the backside of the desert being shaped and molded by a God he, he knows and believes in. But something's about to happen. It says in chapter 3, verse 1, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, and the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. And so when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cries because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And so I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good land, flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel have come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now, that's a long story so far. He goes on, he has a conversation with God about this, and he ends up being victorious, bringing Egypt out. But look what happens. He's out in the middle of the desert. No doubt storms come, lightning comes, fire comes. All these things are happening out there. It's hot. It's the desert. 
And he's sitting at dark and he wonders why on earth this bush is not burning. It's on fire, but it's not burning. It's, we're told that the angel of the Lord was in the bush. You could see the fire, but the bush is not burning. He was trying to set up an opportunity for Moses to notice something weird. And Moses says, I will turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. Now, he could have easily said, I don't know, it's a burning bush. I don't really care. This is not anything abnormal, but he notices the abnormality of what's happening. And when he seeks to check it out, God calls him and gives him his marching orders. God communicates to Moses. He hasn't communicated to him yet, even after running away from Egypt. This is the first time God calls Moses, and what happens It's because something wasn't right. As a police officer, we're trained to look for things that aren't right. But this is a situation that's really weird, and Moses gets called. He, he says, that's weird. God almost sets a trap. He says, I'm going to set this up. If Moses comes my way, I'm going to call him and give him this. And he did by faith. So cool. So cool. Well, there's a second story that I want to tell you about. And this one is a little bit longer, but it has some meaning we need to talk about. We find it in 1 Kings chapter 13. 1 Kings chapter 13. It says, And behold, a man of God went from Judah to Bethel, by the word of the Lord, the Lord called a man, a prophet, to go to Bethel, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. Sin's going on. God's calling his man to go and tell him about it. This is a, verse 2. Then he cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord, and he said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, behold, a child, Josiah by name, shall be born to the house of David, and you... He shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense on you, and men's bones shall be burned on you. By the way, this is a prophecy that is actually fulfilled in 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 15 to 17. It is an amazing prophecy. But we know what happens. Jeroboam gets angry at him, and so he calls for an arrest, verse 4. So it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God who cried out against the altar in Bethel <clears throat> that he stretched out his hand from the altar saying, Arrest him! And then his hand, which was stretched out again, withered so that it could not pull it back to himself. And the altar also split apart and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. A miracle just happened. The word he speaks happens. Amazing. Then the king answered and said to the man, Please entreat the favor of the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored. So the prophet says, this is going to happen. Jeroboam says, arrest that guy. But, but God withers his hand. So he immediately changes tactics and he says, Hey, could you please pray for me so that my hand will be okay? <laughs> So the man of God entreated the Lord, and the king's hand was restored to him and became as before. And the king said to the man of God, Come home with me and refresh yourself, and I will give you a reward. But the man of God said to the king, If you were to give me half your house, I would not go in with you, nor would I eat bread or drink water in this place. For so it was commanded by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall not eat bread, nor drink water, nor return by the same way you came. So he went another way and did not return by the way he came to Bethel. Well, Jeroboam, a sinful king, tells the prophet, Hey, come back, I'll give you a reward or whatever. Who knows how that's going to turn out. But God had already told this unnamed man of God, this unnamed prophet, he said, I don't want you to eat anything in that city. I don't want you to drink anything in that city. And I need you to return home a different way than you came. He's protecting the man of God. And he's testing the man of God to see if he is noble. We learn in Judges chapter 2 and into verse 3 that God has the opportunity to continue to question, continue to battle, continue to bring, send things against us, words and ob to see if we're going to stay obedient to what he says. That's what he does. He gives him an order, and then he waits to see if that's how it's going to play out. 
And he does. The man of God listens. And so he doesn't drink, doesn't go to Jeroboam's house, doesn't eat and drink, and he leaves another way. Well, in verse 11, it says, Now an old prophet who's dwelling in Bethel, that's a big problem number one right now because Bethel is sucked into idolatry by the use of King Jeroboam. You can see that earlier in this, in 1 Kings. Uh, well, 1 Kings chapter 12 talks about it. So he's dwelling in Bethel and his son came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. And they also told their father the words which had spoken to the king. And their father said to them, which way did he go? And for his sons had seen which way the man of God went, that other way he's going. Which way did he go? He told them about that. Verse 13 says, then he said to his son, saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey for him and he rode on it and went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. And then he said to him, are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. And then he said to him, come home and eat with me and eat bread. Why is this prophet who knows what was said, finds another prophet and tempts him against the word of God? You have to be careful about who's talking to us and what they're saying. Whose word is correct? Well, look at well, look what it says in verse 16. He says, and then, I cannot return with you, nor go with you. Neither can I eat bread, nor drink water with you in this place. For I have been told by the word of the Lord, you shall not eat bread, nor drink water, nor return by going the way you came. He responds to this prophet, the Lord said. The Lord said. By the way, when God tells you to do something, it's settled. Do it. We, we learn from Balaam in the book of Numbers. We learn that Balaam, he tells Balaam no. And then he says, well, I'm going to go ask God again. And so then God, who's angry, says, well, all right, well, then I guess you'll go. And then what happens? Judgment comes. God tells him no. The, why is this guy tempting him? He's a prophet. Verse 18, he said, so he said to him, I am also a prophet, as you are. And, and an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, bring him back to you with your, in your house. And he may eat bread and drink with you. He was lying to him. That's what it says in parentheses. He, he was lying to him. Now, here's something we need to remember. Because it has everything to do with what's going on today. God told us something. It's in the book. If it's coming from an angel, it's not from the book. It, Paul says in another letter, he says, if it comes from, if it's, it's accursed, if it comes from an angel or another person or someone came up with some doctrine or they, they saw a dream or something and it goes against what the Bible says, it's accursed. There are false religions that have lots of doctrines that were brought about by angels bringing anti-biblical views. It's accursed. Paul was really clear. There's a reason why in Revelation it says don't add or subtract to the to the what's written in this book. Because right now China is in the midst of a 10-year change the Bible to fit their narrative day. In that one that lady caught in adultery that Jesus forgives and lets her go her way. No, Jesus stones her because you don't cross the church. You don't cross the government. The Ten Commandments have nothing to do with idolatry or loving God anymore. It's loving the state. It's listed there. And if you're not careful, Bibles are going to start changing. Anything that you're reading that's online or that are applications, how far will it go before they start rewriting the Bible? And artificial intelligence has already claimed that it can rewrite the Bible and make it correct. What are you going to do? Make sure you have a paper book Bible. And if anything you see or hear goes against what God said in this book, it's accursed. You don't, don't deal with it. That's just, that's the, that's the lie from the garden. Did God really say? That's what's going on here. This man says, well, an angel came and told me from the Lord that you should come back to my. Well, wait, that's not what God said. What a temptation. It says here he was lying. Verse 19, so he went back with him 
and he ate bread in his house and drank water. He fell for it. And now it happened as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. And he cried out to the man of God who came from Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord, Because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the commandment with, with uh, which the Lord your God commanded you, but you came back, ate bread, drank water in the place of which the Lord said you to you, Eat no bread and eat, drink no water. Your corpse shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. Judgment has been rendered. The old prophet that was lying tells the new prophet who was from Judah, who was who disobeyed God's word, because you disobeyed God's word, you're not going to make it to your father's tomb back home in Judah. How do you handle that now? You've got this unfortunate judgment now it's put on your head well in verse 23 so it was after he had eaten and bread and after he had drunk that he saddled the donkey for him the prophet whom he had brought back and when he was gone a lion met him on the road and killed him and his corpse was thrown on the road now pay attention the donkey stood by it the lion also stood by the corpse and there and there Men passed by and saw the corpse thrown on the road and the lion standing by the corpse. And then they went out and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. Well, that's a weird picture. Lion comes out, kills the man of God, and then on one side of the dead body is a lion. On the other side is a donkey. They're all standing there. Would that catch your... Would that, would that be something weird out of the ordinary? Maybe get your attention? It does. It gets their attention. The men passing by saw the corpse thrown on the road and the lion standing by the corpse. And they went and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. He's like, God, I saw this thing. It was really weird. Man, it was crazy. Verse 26. Now when the prophet who had brought him back from the way heard it, heard the story about the weird thing going on out there. He said, it's the man of God who is disobedient to the word of the Lord. Therefore, the Lord has delivered him to the lion, which has torn him and killed him, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke to him. And he spoke to his sons, saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled it. And when he went and found the corpse thrown on the road and the donkey and the lion standing by the corpse, they're still there. The lion had not eaten the corpse, nor torn the donkey. <laughs> and the prophet took up the corpse of the man of God, laid it on the donkey and brought it back. And so the old prophet came to the city to mourn and to bury him. And then he laid the corpse in his own tomb and they mourned over him saying, alas, my brother. Oh, it's my brother now. I tempted him, he came back and then I pronounced judgment on him and he's dead. So I now I feel guilty and I'm gonna go and get him and I'm gonna bring him back and bury him in my own tomb and I'm gonna mourn him for what has happened. Verse 31. So it was after he had buried him that he spoke to his son saying, when I am dead, bury me in the tomb where the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. For the saying which he cried out by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the shrines on the high places which are in the cities of Samaria will surely come to pass. Verse 33, after this event, Jeroboam did not turn from his evil way. But again, he made priests from every class of people for the high places. Whoever wished, he consecrated them, and he became one of the priests of the high places, totally against God's word. And this thing was the sin of the house of Jeroboam, so as to exterminate and destroy it from the face of the earth. Now, why did this scene happen? First of all, we've talked about it, that if the word comes to you from God, and it could be written in this book, you can't, you can't go against it. It's written. 
So when you're looking at sins going on all around the world, you can say, oh, well, marijuana is legal. No, the Bible says you can't. Oh, I can marry anybody I want. Nope, the Bible says you can't. See, we get ourselves caught into believing that because the world system allows us to do something, that it's okay. That's the reason why the church is starting to say, well, this is outdated. This Bible is outdated. We need to change with the culture. That's the problem. The culture is perverse. And the Bible tells us that the, the culture would get more and more perverse up into the point in time that Jesus came to get the church out of here and judgment would come upon the world. We're staring at it now. You need to live above reproach. You need to live in a way that your character is defined by your conduct. And this man here failed to follow God's word. He gets tempted. He falls into temptation. Whatever it is, maybe he's hungry and maybe he's thirsty. Maybe he just wants what it is. Maybe maybe he just wanted to believe that the angel had this. It, whatever it was, it was against God's word. And God doesn't hold true to that very well. He doesn't like disobedience. So what happens? Judgment comes. Now, we don't know what's in the heart of this man of God, and we don't know why judgment was so fierce. But what we do know is this. God said, you're not going to make it. And sovereignly, he sent a lion. We see that down here, that God sent a lion. So the lion, sent by God, obeyed. He killed the man of God, but he did nothing else. He just stood by. He didn't touch the, he didn't eat the man, and he didn't touch the donkey. Because God ordered him only to kill the prophet and only that it. But the situation has to be weird so people would notice. The man of God would have never noticed that it ever would have happened. That would have been circumstances. It would have been like, well, that's a bummer. That guy got eaten by a lion. Except for the fact that the scene was too random to be random. And God had, a, God had a message, not only for you, but for this man of God who then takes him back, feels pretty bad about it. Hopefully he changed his ways. Jeroboam didn't change. And we see Jeroboam and all of these prophecies this man brought to you, brought up about in chapter 13 of 1 Kings. It all makes total sense. The word is this. Follow God's word. Follow it to the letter you don't get to take it and snip and cut and take this part out and put this part in and decide what's real and what's not. It's the inspired word of God. The whole thing from the first word in Genesis to the last word in Revelation is God inspired through the Holy Spirit and tells us what to do. You cannot go wrong following God's word. And if you obey God's word, you will be blessed. Weird things. Weird things happening. Well, the reason why I tell you this story is because my friend called me the other day. And he said, the weirdest thing happened. I was driving in my, uh, in my car. In my, I have a car that doesn't have a canopy. And I'm not sure if, that's a, if, it, if it's a convertible. We'll use it a convertible. I'm driving in a convertible. And he tells me that he was he was driving in a, he got he was driving 40 miles an hour and got hit by a wasp and the wasp hit him in the hand and it stung him and the wasp was kind of embedded in his hand. Now that's a weird story, but it's pretty random. I've had that happen driving with my arm out the window, got hit by a bee, got stung. I've had that happen. But here's what's strange. He's going through a really bad divorce. He has, been, he has been trying to hear from God for a long time, and God, he feels, has been silent. Now, what he doesn't know is God's been speaking through me to give him instructions, but he's not listening. He hasn't listened yet. He's tried some of those things, but the Bible tells us how to conduct ourselves going through these kinds of situations, and I brought those to his attention, and he, and he hasn't. He's failed to be the spiritual leader of the household, even in the midst of, of, the, of the family currently being torn apart by divorce. 
it's just at the beginning and everything's really fresh and raw and hard. So he's driving along and he gets hit by this wasp and it stings him. But it gives me more details. And he says, look, I was doing 40 miles an hour and the wasp hit me right where my wedding ring should be. And I think it's a message from God. Now I was thinking about it and I thought it quite possibly is. It's far too random to be random. And God uses all kinds of different ways to tell us, to refer us back to the Bible, back to his word so we would understand what he's saying. The answer is in the book. So I started to think about it. I prayed about it. I'm like, Lord, what, what are we supposed to think about this? Well, the number 40, interesting, he told me exactly how fast he was going. And I asked him, "Do you? are you sure? Are you sure you were driving 40 miles an hour? He said, yeah, brother, I totally know this. 40 is the, it has an interesting connotation. It's in 100, 150 plus times in the Bible. And it speaks about mostly trials, tribulations, probationary periods, and renewal. We know that 40 days and 40 nights it rained while Noah was on the ark. We know that Moses went up the mountain and was up there 40 days and 40 nights to, to receive, um, not eating or drinking to receive the Ten Commandments. We know that God told, told Jonah to go tell the Ninevites that in 40 days destruction was going to come. It's over and over and over again. So we know that 40 is a trial. Jesus was tempted for 40 days and 40 nights while he was fasting in the desert before he started his ministry. Tests and trials and difficulties bring on by God so that we can learn from them and we can trust him. That number is replete throughout the Bible. So it sounds like he's in a trial. And if you ask him, he'll tell you it's the worst trial he's ever been in. The hardest trial. God has been quiet. He doesn't know what to do. He's not getting into the Bible like he should. The answers are here. But I have to continually try to get him to do that. He says, I haven't heard from him in a while, and now God might be tra trying to tell me. He's like, look, you are in a trial. But in a 40-day trial, there's always the end of the 40 days, and there is a, well, there's a renewal at the end. Is it possible that God is saying, look, just bear with me. Just bear with me. Now, hang on to that. Wasps are interesting. Wasps are seen three times in the Bible. All three are talking about exactly the same discussion God had with the children of Israel. As he's speaking to Moses about how he's going to let them go into the the promised land. Here's what it says. We see it in Exodus chapter 23, starting in verse 25. So you shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water. And I will take sickness away from the midst of you. No one shall suffer miscarriage or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. I'll take care of you all the way to the end. Verse 27. I will send my fear before you. I will cause confusion among all the people to whom you come. And I will make all of your enemies turn their backs to you. And I will send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, the Hittite from before you. I will not drive them out from bef before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. Little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and you inherit the land. And I will send your bounds and I will set your bounds from the Red Sea to the Philist to Philistia and from the desert to the river. God is saying this. By the way, I <laughs> last month I went to the Bug Museum the Bug Museum told me that, all, that, that very few wasps in Colorado sting. I have to believe with the inundation of all these hornets around here that it was a hornet. And God sent hornets 
millions of them into the land and it chased the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. It got them softened and chased them out of the land. The, the Jews were not a fighting people. They weren't warrior people. He's just telling them, you're not going to need to fight it. I'm going to take care of it. Now we find out later that because Moses misrepresents God and dies in the wilderness, Joshua is a, a, a military leader and he takes it in and it, it turns into war. But here he's telling them, you're going to continue to move through this land if you trust me. I will take care of everything. We know, it, we know that when all the spies come back and give a bad report, they have to turn around and walk around for 40 years, right? And all doing all these things that are hanging out in the wilderness because of judgment. And then war comes after that. But here, God is like, look, I'm going to take care of everything. I'm just going to chase these people out of your land so you can just inhabit it. But I'm not going to go in there and chase everybody out of the land because what happens is then all these wild animals are going to come into the land. You won't be able to handle it and you'll lose the land. I'm going to go little by little. So you go in and I'll chase them out and you inhabit it. And you, I go in and I'll chase them out and then you inhabit. And then I'll go in and chase them out and, I'll, you will, and you can inhabit it. Until you've had all the land that I have for you in my plan. Is it possible that God bounces this hornet off of his ring finger where he's supposed to have his wedding ring to remind him that little by little he's working things out chasing away pride and arrogance chasing away alcoholism and chasing away in both in both parties because there there's too much pride in either of them and they're not going to fix themselves this way but god is using little by little starting to heal this thing. He knows that if he just doesn't allow everyone to come back in and fix it right away, that they're just going to have the same problems they've been having for years, and it's just going to explode again. But if God is trying to heal it, little by little, he's making changes in the hearts of those who are involved. Is it possible that God came to him and said, you keep praying, because in this time of testing, I'm working. I'm little by little. I'm going to give you the land. I'm going to give you back what you're, what you're missing. I'm going to change her heart as she's going to come back. I'm going to change your heart so that you can accept it. I'm going to get rid of all the pride and all the arrogance and all the stuff that is keeping you guys apart. And I'm going to heal your marriage. Is it possible? I'm not a prophet. I'm, not a, I'm a nonprofit organization. And how are we going to know? We're going to have to wait and see because prophecies are always seen when we look back to see that they were fulfilled. But the bird prophecy was fulfilled and the bird prophecy going overhead was fulfilled. And these prophecies that are listed in the Bible that caught people on guard, Moses did exactly what God said he was going to do. And God judged the man and sent a message to the to this other guy that and he got the message too. The Bible tells us that false prophecies fall apart, but prophecies from God never fall apart. I'm not forecasting anything, but what I am doing is I'm using the Bible to interpret the details in this story because it's too random to be random, and God doesn't change. He's the same today, tomorrow, and forever. This is why reading your Bible and praying every day is important. Because when the weird things start to happen, you start to notice. And then you start to interpret because the, because the spirit rests inside you and says, I've got something for you. Do you remember that time in the Bible? Do you remember that number in the Bible? Do you remember that there's only one place where the hornets are in there? That God would use hornets to little by little change the 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 complexity of the situation. It's so good. It's so cool. All of this to say, God may be trying to get your attention. He may be trying to answer your prayers. And he may be doing it in a really strange way. He may be doing it in a way that if, if it was just normal, you'd pass by it. But because the situation is too random to be random... You need to open your eyes to it and start thinking and praying about what God might want to be saying. There's blessing in it. 
There's understanding in it because God wants to tell you the end from the beginning. He wants to encourage you. He wants you to know that he's hearing your voice and that he is listening to your prayers. My heart for you today as you go out here watching weird things happen, that God is talking. Get in the Bible and find out what he's saying. Be blessed.